I've got a friend, and over a decade ago now, he got his first paycheck. He still remembers how much it was, $323. And he was excited, and when he got home, he put down his bag, and he put down the, the paycheck inside of an envelope. He put it on the kitchen table, both of them right next to each other. And this was the only spot, really, in the whole kitchen that even had any space, because his family was, was about to move. Everywhere else was covered. So he put it down, and then he was going to go see some friends. He was excited to deposit it, but it was before the days of mobile deposit, so you get the picture. He, he had to wait till the next day. So he went and saw his friends a couple hours later, came back. His bag was still there, but the envelope with his check, it was gone. And so he's freaking out. He, he's scouring every corner of the kitchen. He checks his room. He calls out to his mom. Hey, I'm like, Mom, where, did, did you see my paycheck? She's like, what paycheck? And he said, yeah, it was in an envelope. It was on the kitchen table right next to my bag. And then she goes blank. And she says, oh, honey, son, I, I'm so sorry. I, that was all garbage on the table. I, I threw all that stuff away, and it's, it's garbage day tomorrow, so it, it's all packed up in the bag. It, it's down by the curb. I'm so sorry. And my friend said, He'll never forget the panicked look that mother and son shared in that moment. Has that ever happened to you? Where you mistake something that's valuable for garbage? Could it happen? Or could the opposite happen? You look at something and it's actually garbage, worth nothing, but, but you mistake it and you think that it's actually really valuable? Could that happen? I'm going to leave you hanging right there and tell you that we've reached chapter 3 of Paul's letter to the people at the church in Philippi. And in chapter 3 here, he, he says some, some different sort of things. He, he calls some people some names. He gives a whole slew of reasons why he could be confident and then he gives us the actual reason that we can have confidence. So we're looking at Philippians 3 this morning, and we're going to start here with verse 1. Here it is. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. Now, I know a bunch of you out there are dog lovers. I am not. I don't have anything against dogs, however. I promise. I promise I'm just telling you what God is saying. And God says, watch out for those dogs. I know that's hard to hear. But in Bible times, dogs, they weren't domesticated and they weren't nice like they are today. Dogs were, were dirty, dangerous strays that were not only a nuisance, but they were also a threat. Everyone in those days knew, watch out for those dogs. So who, who are the dogs? Well, Paul gives two synonyms. He says, watch out for these dogs, evil workers, mutilators of the flesh. Now that might seem like a very odd trio of things to call someone, and in a way it is. Dogs, evil workers, mutilators of the flesh. So who are they? Well, they're actually religious people, Christians even, Jewish Christians who are known as Judaizers. And these Judaizers, they were Jewish people who converted to Christianity, but they said to be a real Christian, you really still have to follow all the old Jewish ceremonies that the Israelites had to follow in the Old Testament, and especially circumcision, which was usually done to baby boys when they were eight days old. Or if you were a convert, to Judaism, it would be done to you at whatever age, whatever time of life 
you converted to Judaism, and they said, those things are all still in effect, all those ceremonies. To become a Christian, you still got to do them. Truth is, though, God said, no. No, you don't have to do all those ceremonies. Circumcision is, is no longer the sign that you belong to God. Paul is saying here, if anyone ever tells you, and this is true for us too, if anyone ever tells you that you can have confidence, your spiritual confidence in yourself, in who you are or what you've done in some way, watch out for them. They're telling you a lie. Because circumcision, like I said, is no longer the sign that you're a Christian. Paul says kind of an odd thing. He says, we are the circumcision. We serve God. We who boast, who find confidence in Christ Jesus. We who put no confidence in the flesh, in ourselves. This is what a Christian does. Everyone finds confidence. Everyone boasts in something. The question is, do you boast? Do you find confidence in Jesus or elsewhere? That's the question. Christians boast in Jesus. But Paul steps back here and in verse 4 he, he goes all hypothetical and he says, well, let's pretend for a minute that, that we could find our confidence in human things. He continues, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more, circumcised on the eighth day, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, because the Pharisees were really good at keeping the law. As for zeal, persecuting the church, because that's what Paul did. That's how zealous he was for God. He thought he was doing a very good thing by persecuting Christians. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. In other words, Paul had all sorts of trophies he could point to if he wanted to. He had the most trophies. He was the model religious person, you might say. So what's your trophy? Is it that you've been a Christian your whole life? Or you read the Bible every day? or you never miss a Sunday service, you're always at every educational opportunity, you never miss a community service event. And in fact, you even do things that nobody asks you to do. You're like the volunteer of all the volunteers. Or is it that you're generous? Or you're incredibly humble? Or is your trophy kind of outside of the spiritual, religious realm? Is it that you have a lot of friends? Or is it your looks? Or the money that you have? Or that you're socially alert? Or that you're smart? Or that you have a successful career? What's your trophy? And, and whatever your trophy is, you would never say, You'd never say that this trophy, it, it earns you salvation or it gets you any closer to God. You would never say that. But in a way, you, you kind of would. Because, see, you're using the gifts that God has given you. You're using them really well. So he's happier with you. And he'll bless you. And this is, see, it's a good thing you're doing. So you look just a little bit better to God and to other people. And whatever this trophy is, you, you hold on to it. You look at it, maybe it, it gives you good memories, or it makes you feel good, l like this trophy does for me. I, I don't know if you can see it, but it says, Watertown Park and Rec Department 2000 Youth Baseball Minor League Fast Pitch Champs. Oh yeah. Lots of good memories from this 9 and 10 year old championship team. And trophies, this trophy, or whatever your trophy is in a spiritual sense, trophies, they're good things usually. This is the hard part. Because reading the Bible every day, wonderful thing. Prioritizing worship with your church family, fantastic. Being generous and humble, amazing. Being wise, having a, a successful career, that's great. Trophies are usually good things. But then 
Paul goes and says this. He says, yeah, whatever that trophy is, whatever you find your confidence in, uh, it's not actually a trophy. It's, it's this. And yes, this is a, a very real bag of garbage from the Lersh household that, frankly, it, it's full of very real smells and very garbagey garbage. It is. And Paul says, your trophies are this. He goes on in verse 7. He says, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage. In other words, your trophies, they were great. They were. But now, consider them garbage. And garbage means useless, worthless, or undesirable material that is usually thrown out. And yes, this can even mean excrement. Paul's saying trophy equals worthless. No value. None. And to be honest, don't you just hate that? Like Paul's saying, the, the good things that you've done, the things about yourself, the good aspects of yourself that you actually find a little pride in, the good parts, they're worthless. They're valueless. They're, they're worth nothing. Doesn't that grind at you? And if you say that deep down you're okay with that, I'm sorry, you're lying. Because that's not how we think. Deep down, each one of us, we want to find worth and value in the good things, at least in the good things, the good parts of us. We don't like that. But Paul says it anyways, because he's in the business of telling us the truth. He goes on. He says, I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Paul knew that though trophies are good, they can be good. If you put your confidence in the trophies, they can also drown out the true trophy. The true trophy that has true value, it can get lost in the value, the seemingly great value, of all the other trophies. And so Paul said, I consider, or I decide to think of everything, everything else as a loss, as garbage, compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. In other words, knowing Jesus as your Lord, as your Savior, it surpasses every other thing, even every other good thing in the world. And Paul wants, he says, to be found in Jesus, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. In other words, doing good things. He doesn't want to be found good based on the good things that he's done. And he wasn't. And neither are you. And this is good news. Because you're not found good based on the good you do. That means you're also not found bad based on the bad things that you do. You're seen as good through faith. You're seen as righteous through faith in Christ. And this is so good because you're not found good because of the good things you do. You're found good through Jesus. Your goodness is given to you by God. And because it is given to you by God, it cannot be taken away. It will not be taken away. To put it another way, with a word that's used a lot these days, you cannot be canceled. You will not be canceled because that's not how God works. God does not dig up your old Facebook posts or your old tweets or the things you said back in 2003 or the things you did or you said in high school or the things you did or said last week. He doesn't dig them up and then hold them over your head and demand that you say sorry in just the right way or he'll stop loving you or demand that you do just the prescribed set of penance, or he'll stop loving you. God doesn't do that. God does not cancel. 
God forgives. He saw, God saw all your garbage, all my garbage, and he covered over it with Jesus' goodness. And so now Jesus' goodness is your goodness. God looked at you and he looked at me and he covered over us with Jesus. And now when he looks at you and me, he sees Jesus. And this is what Paul knew. You can be confident God will never cancel you. That's not what he does. He forgives. And Paul, Paul is just on a roll here. He continues. He says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Paul's saying, I want to know Christ more and more. I want to read the Bible. I want to go to worship. I want to study Jesus' words and his actions with other people. I want to know him more and more. I want to see his resurrection from the dead in all of its beautiful, glorious facets. I want to see it sparkle because his resurrection proves my future resurrection. I want to find my confidence in Christ alone. And as I go through this life, knowing Jesus more and more, I'm embracing even the sufferings in his name, even death, because my confidence is in Jesus. Say it with Paul. I want to know Christ more. I want my confidence to be in him above all other things. Now, maybe you're wondering, whatever happened with that first paycheck and the garbage? Well, long story short, mother and son, they went out to the curb, they cut open that garbage bag, and they went through it. And they put up with all the smells in just the utter grossness of it all. Because what mattered most was among all the garbage, finding the thing of value and holding on to it. And eventually, they found it. The envelope with the paycheck inside still good. And my friend, he walked back to his house, clutching that paycheck like the trophy it was. Now there's an old hymn written in the 1700s. It's called, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. In verse 3, it addresses us. It says this. It says, Sinners whose love can ne'er forget the wormwood and the gall, go, spread your trophies at his feet and crown him Lord of all. My friends, my family, whatever the trophy is from this world that you're clutching, whatever it is out there that you find your confidence in, you can lay it down. Go and put it at Jesus' feet. Because you don't need to hold on to that anymore. Because Jesus is the trophy that you really need. He's the trophy that you have. And Jesus' goodness that he has given to you as a free gift forever, that's where your confidence is. Let me pray for us all. Dear Jesus, give us each the strength and the faith and the trust to hold to you and your goodness as our greatest trophy, even above all the other good things, the good trophies that we have in life. Give us the faith to have our confidence fully in you and in you alone. Because that's the kind of confidence that will never and can never be taken away. In your saving name we pray. Amen.